are tackling part two of matter or what's the matter, which you got to love a good pun, right? So last week, we talked about mixtures, compounds, elements, and started talking about how do we look at the components of matter? How do we break it down to pieces that we can study, that we can understand? So that's super useful, but it was a lot of concepts. So we're going to have more of that this week, but we're going to start getting into the actual theories. Now, we talked about a law. We should talk about a theory. A theory is something that has shown consistently to work. There are a lot of theories out there that we are not able to prove mathematically. We prove it mathematically, we call it a law. Now, it could still be violated, but we can see mathematically why it works. A theory is something where it's consistent, it works, but it doesn't actually have math to back it up, where we can solve it and say, yes, mathematically, this works. We call this a law. So we're talking today about theories, getting into what we would call atomic theory. Now, you hear atom. You know, we've talked about that previously. An atom, A-T-O-M, not atom, that's me. Atoms are those elements, right? That an atom of, I'm, I know I'm emphasizing, I'm trying to make sure I say this properly. An atom of carbon is the simplest form of carbon that you can get down to and still be carbon. If you go any smaller, it's not carbon anymore. But you have an atom of carbon, an atom of sulfur, an atom of oxygen, right? But the problem is, we might have known that atoms were a thing, but when did we decide that? So today we're talking a little bit of history and also atomic theory, how we've understood what atoms are and what we can do with them. So we got a couple of guys we're talking about. So we're talking about a guy named John Dalton. So we are calling this Dalton's atomic theory. So very smart guy in back in the 1600s. And what he was trying to do is he studied chemical reactions. He was a chemist. He might not have called himself that, but that's what he was. So he's studying these and he's trying to figure out why does it work this way? Why does it behave this way? And he came up with what we now call Dalton's atomic theory. And the amazing thing is, this is 400 years ago, right? Is uh, he had, he was pretty close. And the cool thing about atoms is atoms is based on kind of a Greek term is people had theories about atoms for 2,500 years ago you know, uh, several hundred years before Jesus was born. They had theories about this, but they never really tried to lay it out systematically. Dalton is credited with figuring that out. So uh, I'm going to read these to you, and we're just going to talk through this really quick, okay? So there are four parts of Dalton's atomic theory, and you're going to want to get this in your mind. And then we, as we're going to see, he's pretty close. He's not exactly right. So all matter is made up of atoms, which are indestructible and indivisible. So Dalton believed that there, the atom was as small as you could go, and they could not be broken, and they could not be broke, they could not be divided, right? They were permanent. They were forever. Uh, two, he said, all atoms of a given element are identical in their properties. Okay, that makes sense. That an atom of carbon and another atom of carbon are identical. They have their properties are the same. Does that make sense? Compounds are formed by a combination of two or more kinds of atoms. Okay, that's pretty good. And a chemical reaction is a rearrangement of those atoms that exist in the substances which are reacting. So you want to make a compound or you want to have a reaction, the atoms are actually moving. They're changing with where they are. So we understand that that's not perfect. But that's pretty good. I mean, the guy is really smart. So he is sometimes called the father of atomic theory because he laid this out. He's a pretty smart guy. So we owe him a lot. So we'll talk through these different concepts. So if all matter is made of atoms and they are indestructible, so indestructible means they can never be broken, can't be destructed. That, that tells you if you can't destroy atoms, you can't destroy mass. That's part of the law of, of conservation of mass, right? So uh, the second proposition says that all elements are the same. And so that's what said. That's uh, okay. You can't break the atoms down. You can't make the element any simpler. But can an atom be broken down? Hmm, yes, it can. We'll be talking about that. The third is the distinction between compounds and elements. We talked about that. Compounds are made up of elements. Elements are a pure substance. So that's pretty good. They talk about these combinations are molecules. That's another vocab word for this week. 
So a molecule is something made up of several atoms put together. So a molecule of carbon dioxide, we've talked about that, is made up of a carbon and two oxygens, and the molecule is called carbon dioxide. It's a compound, which is a molecule. And then, you, of course, you can break that down to smaller substances. So they have some different things of these. Now, Dalton also did something called the law of multiple proportions. Now, we talked about, uh, you know, we talked about uh, definitive proportions last week, right? Multiple proportions is the same thing. So if two elements come together and you're going to make compounds, a fixed amount of one element will combine with a, another element in the same ratio. Now, that sounds like a lot, but all that really means is that when I make a compound, you know, when I make a molecule, the amount of the different substances I need is consistent. If you're going to make water, it's H2O, right? Two hydrogens, one oxygen. Every molecule of water always has two hydrogens or and an oxygen, or it's not water. It's something else. Now, it could be something interesting, but it's not water. So that's really what he means, and he really laid that out. So there's a couple of different things, but... The law of definitive proportions, right? It's of the multiple proportions is not so much that that law is so mind breaking, right? It's interesting, but the reason is Dalton predicted it. He used science and he used his atomic theory that he was able to try to write down that he said, hey, I can't really see these atoms and I can't be sure, but I believe that every time it is the same because my data says that it is, and even though I can't look in a microscope and I can't see an electron microscope and look at the compounds, right? But I believe this is true and here's how I can prove it. And he was right. So we give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, the thing about these is talking about DNA and things like that. DNA is consistent in the way that it has to be constructed. That falls in the similar concept of that multiple proportions that it has to be put together. It's an incredibly complex thing. And so there's a couple different things of here. Now, here's the trouble. Dalton's a smart guy, right? But he didn't have it all right, okay? So what we would talk about is uh, it's the basics, but there's several things wrong with it. So if you've ever talked a little bit about atomic theory, you probably have heard the term like protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? So the main thing to try with this is you probably learned it something like this, right? So I'm just gonna draw this. So you learned a basic kind of atomic theory. And if you haven't, we'll just talk about that. Is Dalton thought every element was pure. Like it, an, an atom was literally just the thing and it was a solid like piece, kind of like a, like a metal ball bearing, right? Now, what we kind of know is that in an atom, you have what they call the nucleus, right? And inside the nucleus are protons and neutrons. And then outside the nucleus, and sometimes you see it drawn like this, like kind of orbits, are electrons. So electrons, like electronic. And then we have protons and neutrons. Now we're gonna spend more time talking about those. Now, Dalton believed that the atom was indestructible and uh, you know, indestructible, could not be made any smaller and that they were permanent, they could never be changed. Now, as we got further along, we learned that, you know what, these electrons don't have to stay here. These can be, whoop, you can yank those electrons off. That's the basis of electricity, is electrons moving. If you're ever curious about what electricity was, that's more of a physics thing, but we'll do a little bit of that. Protons and neutrons are here in the nucleus, right? But if you take a neutron and you go, bam, you ever played a, you ever played a pool or billiards? You take that cue ball and go, boom, and you break apart all, those, uh, all the balls and you talk when you start in the game. You can take a neutron and go, bam, right into that nucleus, and you can blast that baby apart. You can knock off neutrons. You can knock off protons. So, although... Dalton was really smart. He was not correct in this area. And this is an area, as we've learned more and we've seen, that actually the atom has even smaller pieces. Now, we would call these, because we're not very creative, subatomic 
atomic particles. Subatomic. Sub means small, smaller than. So smaller than atomic, right? Again, we're not very creative. So there's a couple of good things in here, uh, some examples from what's called a Crookes tube, because there's also some things that behave, you know, energy, electromagnetism, things like that, that don't behave in the way that we would expect. They don't follow the normal rules of mass. And that's because you're involving energy. And although mass is related, it's not exactly the same. So I talk about electrons, protons. And the thing about these things is they're so small, you can't really see them, right? Even with a microscope, it's really hard. It's, uh, it's something that you know, Dalton and his things would never have been able to figure it out. So people started to theorize that there were these smaller bits inside the atoms. Now, they didn't really know what to do with them. But they went through a couple of things they called like the plum pudding model, which basically said that you have the electrons and the protons, and they're just kind of in this, like you ever made a, um, like a baked muffin, like with, uh, with chocolate chips in it or blueberries. Like you, op you open the blueberry muffin, and the blueberries are just sort of floating around in there, right? They're in there, but they're just sort of randomly spread out, and they're inside the muffin, but you don't really know where it's going to be. And you take a bite, and you might get a blueberry, you might not, you might get three, right? We might call that the plum pudding model. Again, plum pudding was a lot more common at that time. There's a great picture on page 56 of a plum pudding. So you can kind of see what they were going with. But as they did experiments, they realized that, as I talked about, you could remove electrons. You could remove neutrons and protons. Well, they said, well, obviously things are different. So we came up with what they call the planetary model. You think about a planet, right? Like Earth. And then you have the moon that goes around it, right? So that's where they kind of got the concept of the planetary model, which many of us still use. And this is pretty good. And I think I've told you before, part of science is you learn it in a simplified way. And then as you get older and you have more experience, you learn it in a more detailed way. We know that it's not literally electrons orbiting in a ring around a nucleus, right? but it's a good way to envision it, okay? Now, has anybody ever heard of the Manhattan Project? So you gotta think about that if you need, you need to get, get off on Wikipedia really quick. The Manhattan Project is the team of scientists that designed the first atomic bomb or the nuclear, nuclear weapons. So during, this is during World War II in uh, Chicago and then in uh, Nevada primarily where they were doing testing. And what they were studying there was how do I, they were studying atoms and they were learning that there is a huge amount of energy contained inside atoms. But what I have to do is in that nucleus, right? We have the, the neutrons and the protons. If I can break them apart, I can release huge amounts of energy. So what they would do is take a neutron, which is a tiny dense ball. And again, think like a, a billiard ball, right? The cue ball. And when it hits the rest of the, thing, the, the all the balls together, it, bam, blasts them apart. Well, there was huge amounts of energy holding those together. When you blast them apart, that energy has to go somewhere. But when those neutrons fly apart, they start hitting other, they hit other atoms and they blow them apart. And what you end up with is a chain reaction where you release a huge amount of energy. And that is literally what is happening in an atomic reactor, a nuclear reactor. If you've ever gone like to Russellville, Arkansas, I drive by there sometimes, there is a very large nuclear reactor there. You can see it from the interstate. Uh, it's got the big cooling tower. They are using this in a controlled way to release that energy to make electricity. In the same way, so it can be used for weapons or it can be used to power the lights in your house. So that's the crazy thing about atoms. Now, Dalton thought that you couldn't separate these things, right? And that, uh, let's, I want to read back on exactly the wording. So, all atoms of an element are identical, eh, but they're not all identical. They have slight differences, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, there's a, has anyone ever, you ever heard of the Hindenburg? You know, the Hindenburg is a famous blimp or a Zeppelin fire and explosion because they had a Zeppelin full of hydrogen. And they used it to, as like a way of mass transit. They would travel back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean with it. And the trouble is, is that it caught on fire. And there's a, this is just early enough that we have video of it. And, you know, if you've ever heard the, oh, the humanity, that is from the recording of the Hindenburg. 
It's a very sad situation, but it's something that can teach us about the power of atoms, the power of knowing what you're dealing with. And it's one of those things. So talk about elements. We talked a little bit about these. You can take a look at um, hydrogen is the lightest element we have. Helium is a second. So like when we have a gas helium, right? You get a helium balloon. Helium is not flammable. Hydrogen is very flammable, but hydrogen is half the weight of helium. Has, it has less protons and neutrons and electrons. So it doesn't weigh very much. It's so light, it's great for filling a balloon, but it's really flammable. So it's really dangerous. There's some examples of um, neutrons and protons and setups on page 59. So one thing we want to keep in touch is uh, isotopes. This is a term that you sometimes run into. So an isotope tells us that the, we were talking here about hydrogen. Hydrogen can either have, must have one proton. That's its atomic number. That's how you know it's hydrogen. It has one proton. But it could be one proton and no neutrons. Neutrons are kind of bonus. They have extra, they give extra mass, but they don't have any charge. So you could have one proton and no neutrons, or one proton and one neutron, or one proton and two neutrons. Those are all still hydrogens, but they don't have the same mass, right? They, do, they don't weigh the same. So we call those isotopes, different numbers of neutrons. So there's a couple of different examples here on atomic theory. So this raises an interesting question. Was, was Dalton a bad scientist because several of his ideas were proven wrong? No. Many scientists, pretty much all scientists, eventually are proven wrong. That's the thing about science. Science is always changing and growing and developing. That's why science and, you know, religion or spirituality or, you know, studying God's power is that God is eternal and science is always changing. And that's why I think they go really well together is because it's important to realize that we don't treat God with science. We understand the world with science and it can tell us about God, but science is always changing. We often, I was talking with my wife, Angela, the other day. We were in the car and I was talking about this lesson. And I said, I wonder when I'm old and gray and my grandkids are visiting me, I wonder what it is that I'm going to believe or I grew up learning about science that they now know is not right. You know, there's going to be probably a lot of things that we think are, are laws that they never change, that they couldn't change, but they will change. And that's one of the things that we have to understand as a scientist. So Dalton is definitely not a bad scientist. He was doing great work at his time. And that's okay. No matter what you study, if you're in science, if you're in mathematics, you're probably going to have one day realize that whatever you thought you knew, you didn't know. And that's okay. That's really normal. Because it says that, uh, that science is valuable, but it is flawed. And we need to realize that. That even what we call laws or theories, they're they could be changed. They could be wrong. We could learn that we were wrong and that's okay. So we want to make sure we kind of treat our science with, we admire it, but we don't worship it, right? Because it can change. It's changeable. And we don't want to put our faith in something like that. So we got a few examples that you're going to be doing. You're going to be working through, uh, you know, practices on mixtures, pure substances. You're going to be doing some simple uh, conversions. We're going to talk about finding the formula, right? That's that proportionate stuff. We've got examples for those. We're going to be talking about um, substances, about being consistent with Dalton's theory or inconsistent. We're going to have all that written up for you. But I, I hope this has been helpful for you. Looking forward to talk to you guys soon.